And well, happy Wednesday, John. Hey, Carrie. Yeah, this is different, isn't it? Usually it's Monday morning. Yes. So I, I bet we're wider awake right now than we usually are. Oh, yeah. Well, for yeah, I would agree with that. Definitely. <laughs> So, so what about these things is, uh, what does it mean for, well, what does it mean is the question. So, well, well, one thing it means is that, um, if you're a standard issue political operative or a finance guy or a lawyer, never join a presidential administration because <laughs> as soon as there's a, a special counsel and there's always a special counsel, they start looking into people for things that are really far afield from the original um, mandate. You know, this this one, the, um, the Mueller investigation, is about collusion with Russia to yeah. steal the election, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they end up investigating these guys for, you know, bank fraud and, and stuff like that. The, the Manafort convictions were for bank fraud, which, which had nothing to do with the whole Russia thing. But once they... You know, once they open an investigation, they can go anywhere they want to. So unless you're squeaky clean, something of yours that makes you look bad could come to light in the next um, grand jury, special investigation, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. And none of these guys are squeaky clean, not not Republican or Democrat. Every major political operative in the country, I guarantee you, uh, has done stuff that is either wildly unethical or flat out illegal. And if it comes to light, they go to jail and they become household names. You know, who'd heard of Paul Manafort before this <laughs> or the other guy, Cohen? Nobody, nobody outside their their very limited circle of um, of high power political operatives and their clients. But now we all know who they are yes, <laughs> now, and all the, the the prisoners in the prisons they go to will know who they are, too. So yeah. this wasn't a good outcome for them. <laughs> no, not a good outcome. Uh, this is what happens with special prosecutors. And I thought for sure the Manafort thing, because they, you know, they were in deliberations for four days. I thought for sure this was going to be hung jury. I even went out on the bandwagon. I, I, I heard on YouTube about it and I was totally, totally wrong. I admit it. I'm really surprised, though, because I figured this has become totally political. There would be a couple of implants, some uh, some conservative uh, Republican implants, stealth ones on the jury, and they'd hang it up. But uh, somehow they got it done. But we got a couple of questions for you, John. As always, you get the most questions of anybody on the show. Here, this is from Josh. Can you ask John Rabino what he thinks about the Financial Times article last weekend saying how Russia is adding a $7.5 billion tax to the whole mining industry in its country to make up for economic losses? What would stop any country from doing this in the future? It would crush the mining stocks. Thanks, Josh. Well, the, the answer is there's not a lot stopping countries from doing really crazy aggressive stuff when they start running out of money. And historically, you can find all kinds of examples of just of things that just sound outrageous to us today that countries have done in the past and raising taxes on um, captive audience kinds of companies like mining companies that can't get out. You know, they can't pick up and move because their mine is in that country. Yeah. Um, that's a really easy target. So it wouldn't be a surprise to see that happen. However, the, um, the flip side of that is that there's a downside for countries who do that because a lot of people work in those industries. And if the industries are successful enough to want to aggressively tax, that means they're probably adding people. So they're a source of jobs at a time when jobs are probably scarce because that, that's the nature of financial crises. You, people are being thrown out of work and that's the thing that's really <laughs> scaring you as a, as a government, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't want tens of thousands of unemployed people in the street. So you want to keep them working to the extent that you can. And if you tax mines and people get thrown out of work as a result, you, you kind of cut your own throat in that case. So that will limit um, the, the aggressiveness of governments in the next crisis. But, you know, if, if gold and silver are going up in value or up in price, 
and governments are running out of money, it, it wouldn't be a surprise to see something like a windfall profits tax on the, the companies or some kind of a wealth expropriation of holders of gold and silver take place, uh, which is why you need to diversify. So have some at home that nobody knows about, have some precious metals stored overseas that uh, the IRS can't get at, and then own some mining stocks, but know that those mining stocks might be impacted by government actions in the future. Uh, but there are a lot of mining companies that are headquartered outside of your country, wherever you live. If you're in Mexico or in Canada or the US, you still have access to a lot of mining stocks that aren't really subject to your local government taxing authorities. So that's another kind of diversification. Start paying attention to where these companies are located and make sure it's, first of all, mining friendly domicile to begin with. And second of all, that you're spread around a bit, have some Canadian mining stocks, some Mexican silver miners and some U.S miners in your portfolio, uh, which you can get, by the way, by uh, buying an ETF like GDX or DG GDXJ, because they, they do the diversifying for you. And in that way, one country acting crazy doesn't impact your whole portfolio. But that's all you can really do. There are no guarantees. And it is highly likely that when it really hits the fan in the next few years, that governments are going to start doing things that seem like they're out of left field, but are really consistent with the historical behavior of governments. And it's going to impact people who are successful investors. You know, if you made the right decisions, then you are a target because that's where the money is in whatever asset class you've decided to load up on. Yeah. So diversification. That is a great point and uh, fully agree with you on it, John. Uh, so we've got another question from Bill. Bill, long term, long time Member of the FSN community, it's actually two questions uh, about what you mean by a global financial reset. Question one, please define and explain what happens to, say, 100K in the bank and how soon will it happen? You know, everybody wants to know that. Would it happen overnight? What is the exact effect? Would 100K become worth 20K in purchasing power? So a $2 loaf of bread now costs 10 and 200K house becomes worth a million, how to prepare, buy house, gold in advance. Meanwhile, I hear about this reset a lot lately. I think it more likely that the government makes inflation rise, assuming they can. Why? So that there aren't global riots when folks wake up Monday morning after the global financial reset, only to find their savings nest egg lost 80 percent of its value so second question for john would be is a reset more likely than runaway inflation and if so why well they're already doing the inflation thing now um th there's no logical reason why money should change in value it ideally should just hold its value in other words inflation should be zero and that allows us to plan ahead knowing what our money is going to be worth in the future uh governments though have a explicit target of two percent inflation and you hear a lot of chatter about how well maybe we could have three or four percent inflation for a few years till we get out from under our current problems um so they're already doing the inflation thing where they lower the value of your savings by a certain amount each year uh, for instance social security payments have have been adjusted for quite a while inadequately for the actual cost of living for for senior citizens so today's social security checks buy like 30 percent less right. of real stuff than they did uh, a few decades ago um so they're already doing that but the problem with that is that people figure it out eventually and they start front running in other words they they dump the currency that's being inflated as soon as they get any by buying real stuff. And once that starts to spin out of control, the governments lose control of the narrative. They, they don't have the ability to affect events anymore because nobody wants the currency they're using to manipulate the world. So historically, what happens is, and, and this has happened dozens of times in history, um, 
it gets bad. You know, the, the currency is less and less respected and it, it starts to lose value and people start to front run, front run the process. And governments finally say, all right, you know, we, we got to get out ahead of this. We have to just do a massive devaluation and then start over. In other words, lop some zeros off the currency, which just happened in Venezuela, by the way. They devalued by 95 percent and lopped four or five zeros off their currency. Yeah. Um, and, and they sprung it on everybody by, by surprise. You didn't see any articles about that coming, but no, no, it was headlines everywhere after it happened. So that's what we'll end up doing just because there isn't an alternative. You can't run increasing inflation forever because the markets don't let you do it. Um, so historically what countries do is they, um, they announce that they're calling in all the old currency. They're going to replace it with the new currency. And they announce it on a weekend when the markets are closed. So you can't go out and do anything about it on Monday morning. It's a fait accompli. It's done. Uh, so what we will do this time around is probably something really similar to that. And a as for the timing, <laughs> Jim Rickards has a, um, a good story uh, where where he says that a lot of his clients are, are telling him, well, you know what, we're going to stay with our current portfolio. Uh, but then when the reset is is ready to happen, tell me about it and then I'll switch. And, and he says, well, no, that's not how it works, because I'm not going to know when it happens. Nobody's going to know when it happens. They're going to spring it by surprise. So you have to get out in front of it now by by rearranging your finances to prepare for it. And that's all we can do. And if it takes a year, that would be cool. If it takes five years, that's a long time to wait, but um, that's just the way it is. We can't know the timing of this thing because by definition, um, the timing has to be a surprise. Yeah, I, I'm totally in agreement with you because if they told you, it wouldn't be a secret, right? That's what my right. brother used to say when he was teasing the hell out of me. And that's what governments do. They treat you like a big brother would treat you and you know keep your keep you uh fat dumb and happy they give you the mushroom treatment if you don't know what the mushroom treatment is uh to keep them in the dark and feed them plenty of fertilizer you know this is a family show so we don't want to use profanity mm -hmm. but you know what i'm saying that's that's what it's about hey one more question from tyree listener love your show and tune in daily hey well I hope you got a little more to do than that, but hey, thank you. It's worth it. I was wondering if you, John, or another qualified person, I don't know who that would be, uh, you could, you interview, could answer my question of what happens to the $600 billion worth of existing securities that the Fed plans to dump and continue to dump in the months and years to come, if they actually can, on the markets? Who's buying these? Where do they go if no one buys them? I've heard many people talking about the reversal of the Fed, meaning their balance sheet effectively, but no one has mentioned anything about what happens to them. And I'll just stick one thing in here. It's like, look, if you remember, like the Fed, one day they woke up and they told, who was it, Bank of America, you are now the proud owner of Merrill Lynch. And they said, but we don't want Merrill Lynch, but nope, you are the proud owner of Merrill Lynch. Another time, uh, the Chase woke up and said, hey, you've got Washington Mutual, just what you always wanted, right? So they make the banks an offer that they cannot refuse. And in a lot of instances, they won't charge them cash to do it. They'll say, uh, you know, they'll sell them off to hedge funds, deeply discounted, and basically just uh, say, all right, pay us, you know, in two, three years. And by then there'd be refinances of these portfolios, everything else. That's my take on it, John. What's what's your take? Well, what the Fed is doing right now is is not selling their portfolio on the market. They're just letting them run off. You know, these bonds have maturities. Correct. And let's say it's a one year paper, piece of paper. And in a year... Um, it ceases to exist. So that's what the Fed is doing. It's just letting its portfolio run off. And what what is it? It's um, 50 or $60 billion a year. It's a, it's a fairly small number that it, that's running off. But it 
is an inflection in the trend because the, the Fed used to be buying a lot of bonds in the open market. So it's a portfolio of government paper and um, um, mortgage, GSE paper. Mortgage-backed uh, securities. Yeah, yeah. mortgage-backed securities. That, that, that was growing. And now it's shrinking, not very quickly, but it is shrinking. So that means the, the Fed is pumping less money into the system than it was during the, the heyday of QE. So they call that quantitative tightening. And it is a form of tightening. You know, if you stop easing, that's tightening relative to what you were doing before. So what we're doing now is decreasing the money supply, other things being equal. You know, through this one action, it's decreasing the money supply relative to what it was in the past um, over time. It's not aggressive, but it is a, a change in policy. And they could make it more aggressive if they wanted to. See, if they wanted to dump bonds on the market, they just call up the banks. Like, like you said, Kerry, they, they can either call up J.P. Morgan Chase and say, hey, we need you to buy $100 billion worth of 10-year treasuries. And J.P. Morgan Chase pretty much has to do it. Or they just offer those bonds at the prevailing price. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a big liquid market. So you can sell billions of dollars of U.S. government bonds very easily out there because it's a global market um, in, in the multi-trillions of dollars. So they, they could do it if they wanted to. They don't want to. They don't want to aggressively ease because they're terrified. They, they know how fragile the system is because we've, we've not deleveraged like we should have after the last debt-driven crisis. Right. We've actually hyper leverage. We've taken on way more debt than we had during 2008, 2009, when that debt almost blew up the system. So the guys who have engineered that process know how fragile the system is. And they know they kind of have to stop QE at some point, or they think they do. Um, but they want to do it gradually so they can kind of control the process. Um, at some point, they'll lose control of the process, of course. But right now, they're, they're doing it in a, in a gradual enough way that it seems like a non-event. And it, it's possible that that goes on for a while. But eventually, uh, all of these non-events become serious events and, and the thing spins out of control. It's just a question of timing. Yeah. So, yeah, the concept of uh, what they're doing, like, I guess, in a way, it's kind of a vote of confidence for the uh, mortgage-backed security market. So let the mortgages run out they, between refinances, because they own all these bonds that were tranched and everything else, between refinances, between payoffs, early payoffs, you know, people are dying and their estates paying off, they sell the property, pay off the mortgage, uh, and then also uh, foreclosures. There's still some going through the system, although that's drastically lower than it was. Between all that stuff, they were getting something like I calculated at 1.60 billion a month in payments. So even though the uh, bonds themselves might be around, what what they were doing, uh, and before I get into that, what they were doing with the proceeds was simply buying more of the mortgage-backed securities to keep the mortgage market liquefied and to keep the housing boom going. That's what they were doing um, even after they said they stopped quantitative easing. So if what they're saying is we're just going to let these things, these bonds go to maturity and, and then we'll do something with the cash, I don't know what they're going to do with the cash. Uh, I guess they can loan it out, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, eventually all these bonds because the real estate market has so recovered john from its bottom it's it's it peaks again that all these bonds that were worthless although they did buy them at 100 cents on the dollar because they're just such nice guys and they wanted to help their friends at jp morgan and city and all of those places but nonetheless those bonds are worth more than they paid for them and a lot of what they what was represented, the assets backing it, the mortgages backing those bonds, have been paid down or foreclosed out. And they made vast sums over the last several years on foreclosures, John. The foreclosures went for more than was outstanding in a lot of cases on the mortgages. You know, they're doing fine. So those things turned out to be like as the 
buyer of last resort, they turned out to be almost a good investment. They certainly didn't lose. They probably made on them. So point is that, uh, like you said, they're running the bonds to term and just letting them fall off, but there's still a huge deficit. So they're going to be, the money is going in to finance the deficit somehow, John. I don't know where, but somewhere on their balance sheet, that's $60 billion a month they were getting in or whatever it was, $6 billion. I don't know the exact number, but it was a su substantial amount of money, especially with the refis and the payoffs, all that stuff and the foreclosures. It was a ton of money. So they'll probably use that to pay down, partially offset the deficit, monetize the deficit, which is what they do best. So it's all kind of interesting. And uh, yeah, if they want to sell bonds, uh, they just have to put out the word that they're selling them. That is a deflationary event. It sucks money out of the system. But I tend to agree with you. It's probably not what they're doing. It seems like there's a boatload of money floating around all over the place, John. Well, yeah, the Fed is, is slightly tighter than it has been in the past. But the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank are still aggressively easing. So globally, uh, and, and that's the only way you really want to look at this because money is fungible. You know, you don't look at one country. You have to look at the global money supply. It is still increasing at a rate that normally we would consider to be aggressive. You know, we're, we're still very easy monetarily out in the world. And that's why asset prices are still going up. Uh, if the global money supply was shrinking, you wouldn't see the stock market go up. <laughs> that, that, that just wouldn't happen. You wouldn't see real estate prices continue to climb like they are. So that's a sign that uh, the money is still pretty easy. But that can't continue. You know, the ECB is thinking about tightening. The, um, the, the Bank of Japan is, is not talking about tightening yet, but it's, it's starting to talk about how it's going to do it in the future. And, and maybe it will in two or three years. You know, so we're heading that way. Um, and there will come a time when the global money supply starts to shrink, when we're objectively tight, because that's – how it has to be with inflation now above 2% and still rising. Uh, you, you get these imbalances that you have to counter with less easy money. Uh, and when that happens, all of these asset prices that are perfection right now, that rely on absolutely perfect outcomes for Google or Netflix or for oh, yeah. Japan's government's finances, whatever, you know, it all has to be perfect. It won't be perfect anymore. And there, there will be air pockets under a lot of these asset prices, which is to say we'll have, you know, best case, a normal um, recession and bear market at the end of a long expansion. You know, even in good normal times, a 10 year expansion like we've yeah. had ends with a recession and a bear market. These aren't normal times. We're, we're so highly leveraged that, um, that what once was a normal thing is now systemically really dangerous. And that's what we're heading for. So that's what we have to keep in mind that it feels normal out there, but it's not normal. And it will definitely not be normal during the next recession. Yeah, I agree. And I think, well, you know, arguably we never really had a recovery from the last recession. I think that recovery has only come about now. So could be a little deceptive. You know, you know how they lie about the statistics and all that. I don't think we ever really had a recovery other than in asset prices. Now the economic recovery is following eight years later and we'll see what happens. Say, hey, here's a joke from a, a regular FSN community member, Roger. He said, have you heard about the group DAM, D-A-M, Mothers Against Dyslexia? <laughs> <laughs> hey, and never go to a dyslexic tattoo artist don't uh, don't hire a dyslexic air traffic controller you're only going to have problems so uh, keeping that advice in mind you should be able to avoid a lot of the pitfalls of of uh, affirmative action you know affirmative action for dyslexics is, is not a good thing and some of my best friends are listexic so uh, <laughs> what are you going to do <laughs> but john you know it's it's just a house of cards, but the question is, is it always a house of cards? 
when you when I've I'm a big history buff of the history of New York City. It's so fascinating, and effectively, the New York City has always been on razor's edge, a knife's edge. They've never been able to balance it and get the thing working properly because it's always grown faster, or it's falling apart faster than they can fix it, or you know they need more money than they can possibly tax. All of these things they can't figure out ever how to run that place properly. Uh, and there are cities in the world that do run properly, um, but certainly not that one and not many in the United States, but there are some that do run right. Well, Carrie, the difference between then and now is that we're all New York City. Yeah. Now. <laughs> Every place yeah. is on a knife edge financially. Yeah. And no place is is able to find the funds to cover their day-to-day -day expenses so they're all borrowing money whether it's chicago or illinois or california or japan or most of europe everybody's in the same boat yes. uh, that's why this is different well it used to be that a city could go bankrupt or have financial troubles in the context of everybody else being basically okay and it wasn't a big deal now it's everybody who's not okay Hey, you know, uh, one day we're going to be sorry that the Chinese stopped taking our garbage. <laughs> you know, well, we someday we might be grateful to have garbage because it's all we have to pick through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, here's a guy uh, talking to you, uh, talking to us. He just returned from Tibet. This is a while ago, back in June. He was able to get access to Wi-Fi in Kathmandu and downloaded a bunch of FSN podcasts. He said, we saved the trip. It was a 28 hour flight and your podcast really helped entertain me across the ocean. <laughs> I mean, you oh. know, you just don't know, but, uh, and I really like, uh, Rubino and Hemke. It was an interesting trip. So traveled with some very knowledgeable people from India. They are all U.S. citizens and pretty much resent the Ill illegals coming in. They work hard to get where they are. I learned a great deal from them and also from the trip. China has total control of Tibet. And if we think we live in a police state, go to Tibet. Adds new meaning to the concept. Keep up the good work. Look forward to your guys' podcasts. Anyway, that was from Marion, and uh, I've been meaning to like respond to this for months now. Sorry for the delay, but uh, hey, it's uh, I'm glad we could be entertaining uh, on these transcontinental, transpacific flights. However, you came back, transoceanic flights over the Indian subcontinent. I mean, really. Hey, John, we're like a worldwide phenomena here. Do you realize yeah, that? You've gone global. <laughs> God. Congratulations. Hey, people can't, they go through withdrawal. They go through for FSN withdrawal. I don't know what the symptoms are, but probably a sudden increase in IQ and a, a realization that nobody knows anything. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that everybody's lying and uh, somehow the truth will come out of all the lies the lies will set the truth free and maybe that should be our new slogan i don't know but uh, hey marion thanks uh, it's great to hear from you and glad we could be of assistance 